Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Inside Immigration webinar. Today, we're joined by Managing Partner Stephen Green and Senior Associate Kelly Goldthorpe. If you have any questions, you can reach out to us at infoatgans.com or by contacting the email addresses provided on the screen. The panelists will also save some time at the end of the webinar for some questions, so please feel free to type out the questions in the text box pop-up menu on the right side of your screen. And with that, I'll hand things over to our panelists. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is safe and healthy during these uh, interesting times. So what we plan to do today is to give you a general overview of who is eligible to come into Canada. So basically the mobility rights of people that want to enter Canada. And it's very important to understand that the information we are providing today is extremely fluid and the government of Canada is constantly reviewing their plans as with respect to public safety and how the entry of people into Canada could af affect the public safety of Canadians or permanent residents and therefore they are always amending and trying to make it safer for all of us who are currently inside of Canada. So the first question one always will ask now is, who can travel to Canada? And the way the Canadian government has determined that is by putting out a blanket statement right now saying, everybody is banned from entering Canada unless you fall into certain exceptions to the rule. So we start off with the premise, no, I cannot come into Canada, but I have to inquire to see if the Canadian government has made an exception for me. Am I a Canadian citizen? Do I fall into one of those exceptions? Am I a permanent resident? Do I fall into those? I'm a worker outside of Canada with a valid work permit. Can I come? Can I come and visit Canada? So those are the questions that we are going to try to answer today. And it's you know interesting that the government has given tremendous power to our airline industry now to help them, meaning them, meaning the Canadian government, in determining based on policies created by the Canadian government, who can enter into Canada. So when you sort of step back for a moment and you say, my goodness, you mean the Canadian government has given the airlines the authority to make a lot of these decisions on Canadians behalf? And the answer is yes. So the first sort of guard keeper that you have to satisfy if you are outside of Canada and coming into Canada or attempting to come into Canada through an airline is that you have to self-identify yourself to the airline and say, hey, I know there is a ban to enter Canada, but I qualify for one of the exceptions. And some of the exceptions we're going to discuss now and the way it works is like this the canadian government has indicated that if i am a canadian citizen and i am a permanent resident i have the right to enter canada from a mobility perspective meaning i have the right to knock on canada's door and identify myself as a canadian as a permanent resident and the ability to come in. Doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to get in, but I have the right, because that's an exception to the rule. Another exception to the rule is that if I am currently on a work permit outside of Canada, and I want to come back into Canada, I have the right to knock on the door and say, hey, I fall into the exception to the rule, I'm currently on a valid work permit. If I'm currently on a study permit, I have the right to come into Canada. If I have been approved for a work permit, I have the right to come into Canada. If I have been approved for a study permit prior to March 18th, I have the right to come into Canada. 
So as you see, the band sounds very broad, but then when you look at the exceptions to the rule, there are quite a lot of people that are able to enter Canada. And another exception to the rule that the government has permitted is immediate family members. And what does an immediate family member mean? It means that if I am the spouse, common law partner, same sex partner, a dependent child, meaning I'm under the age of 22. If I am the parent of any Canadian citizen in Canada, any permanent resident in Canada, any work permit holder in Canada, any study permit holder inside of Canada, I am permitted to ask permission to come into Canada as part of that exception. So you see now that the exception to the ban is quite liberal. And we've created a chart for you, which we think will assist in showing who is eligible for all these exceptions. And really, when you look at the laws that the government has passed with respect to the exceptions, it's divided into two categories. People that are currently in the United States and people that are everywhere else but the United States that want to enter Canada. And if you are in the United States and you want to come back to Canada, you must satisfy the airline if you're flying into Canada that you fall within one of those exceptions and then once you arrive into Canada at the airport be it Vancouver, Toronto, Calgary, anywhere in Canada you must then satisfy the officer that you do fall within one of the exceptions so you had to satisfy the airline now you have to satisfy the border service officer, but you must also satisfy that border service officer that you're not coming to Canada for a discretionary or optional purpose. And a discretionary or optional purpose could be, I want to come and just visit Canada. Or I'm coming here because I just want to sort of ride out the storm during the coronavirus uh, pandemic. I just want to sort of stay in Canada. And if that is your reason for coming to Canada, then the border service officer will have the right to deny you entry into Canada, even though you meet one of the exceptions to the ban. So you must be able to satisfy that border service officer that your entry is not discretionary or optional and it'll be interesting to see as the you know the months are getting warmer now a lot of people uh, from outside of Canada along the borders of Canada and the United States may have you know purchased summer homes and they want to come up for the summer to spend time at those homes they won't be able to if the current ban still exists because they won't be able to satisfy that border officer that their entry into Canada is not you know, optional or discretionary. So those are all the people in the United States that want to come here, be it a Canadian citizen, be it a permanent resident. And you may sort of question, what do you mean a Canadian citizen? They have the right to come into Canada. They have the absolute right to come into Canada, but if Canada is not truly their home or they're not intending to remain in Canada, they're kind of weighing out the storm, then the border service officer could say, well, based on the pandemic, you're coming for a discretionary purpose. We're not going to you know, permit you. So you see that you know, there's a lot of power that these border service officers have. But if you're coming from another country besides the United States, then the same rules apply where you have to be a 
Canadian citizen, permanent resident, immediate family member, you know, you currently have a work permit, you currently have a study permit prior to the 18th of um, March, and you have the right to get on that plane. But they've added a, another step that somebody who is an immediate family member of someone on a work permit or study permit or Canadian citizen or permanent resident and they want to come and join that person and they only have a visitor visa or they come from a country that doesn't require a visitor visa like France or Italy or anywhere in um, Europe, they must get the normal ETA, which everyone must get if you don't uh, apply for a visa. But you must get a letter from a Canadian embassy or high commission abroad, which indicates that the Canadian government is satisfied that you are not coming to Canada for a discretionary purpose. So with that, you must get that additional letter. People that are coming from the United States do not need that letter from an embassy, so they can just drive up to the border or they can fly into Canada from the United States. But people that are coming from outside of uh, the United States, they must have that special letter saying that they are eligible to come into Canada. But then again, it's still up to the border officer despite the fact you have that letter, to decide if your entry is going to be um, discretionary or optional. So once you've satisfied the airline or the border service officer, there still is a second questioning that the border service officer will inquire. And that's under the Quarantine Act. And there, you as a new person coming to Canada during this pandemic must be able to satisfy the border service officer that you have a quarantine plan in place for 14 days. And some of the questions that the officer will inquire about is where are you going to be staying? How are you going to get groceries? How are you going to get um, pharmaceutical products if you need them? Are you coming into Canada as an immediate family member and will you be quarantining with someone that is vulnerable? And they define what that means. So if you are 65 or older and the person is in Canada, that 65 year old, they're considered a vulnerable person, you cannot quarantine with them unless they are an adult and they give you proof that they consent to that. So you would have to demonstrate to the border service officer that you have the consent of that vulnerable person. And vulnerable people also um, include individuals that may have their immune deficiency, uh, you know, is weak because perhaps they're unfortunately going through chemotherapy, those types of things. So not only do you have to meet the immigration rules that you're coming, you fall within the exception that it's not discretionary or optional. You must then demonstrate that you have a full quarantine plan. And if you don't have that quarantine plan, you will be denied entry into Canada. You must also be in possession of a mask when you are interviewed by the border service officer. And if you don't, they do not have to interview you and they can turn you around. If you don't have a proper quarantine plan, then the government does have the ability to put you in one of their facilities for the 14 days. Um, and they will then, you know, permit you to come in. But with the development of these bans and with this concept of essential services, workers that are coming into Canada must be also able to establish that they're coming to a business that is considered essential, that the business that they're coming to is open still. So for example, if you were a chef and you were outside of Canada and you were coming in and you have a valid work permit, 
that's not discretionary or optional because you've got a valid work permit, you are coming to work. But if the restaurants close, like in many provinces, they're considered non-essential services, then you will not be permitted into Canada. And remember that all foreign nationals, people being on work permits or immediate family members that are on visitor uh, visas or e you know, ETAs, you all have the obligation to satisfy that border service officer that you meet all of the requirements and that you are coming for example as a media family member here is your marriage certificate here is the birth certificate to show that your child is a canadian citizen so you have to be able to meet all of those things and then of course go into your quarantine and if you are permitted to come in and you abide by the quarantine the government as of four or five days ago had amended the immigration regulations with respect to compliance of these quarantine plans and Kelly's going to talk about quarantine and what's required with respect to compliance and it can be quite serious if you as an employer don't abide by the compliance rules or even you as an employee can be in serious difficulty if you don't quarantine. Yeah, so that's right. Last week, new regulations under the Immigration and Refugee Protection Regulations were created, which created additional obligations for employers. So these new measures allow inspections to be initiated in situations when a communicable disease presents at the workplace of a foreign worker or when a foreign worker is or was required to comply with one of the orders in the Emergencies or the Quarantine Act. So the COVID-19 related obligations that were introduced include employers cannot impede on a foreign worker's ability to comply with requirements under the Emergencies Act or the Quarantine Act. Anyone entering Canada must now self-isolate for a 14-day period upon entry, subject to limited exceptions for individuals who have received pre-approval. Enforcing a foreign worker to show up at a workplace during the 14-day period is considered a violation of this new requirement. Employers cannot interfere with any requirements that the foreign national must meet under provincial legislation dealing with public health as a result of COVID-19. And employers who provide accommodation, which is mandatory under some labor market impact assessments, there are even greater obligations. So they're required to provide their foreign workers with cleaning supplies. They must ensure that self-isolating and quarantine foreign workers are separate from other foreign workers and they must have available space for, um, have two space available for other people. And foreign workers who display any COVID-19 symptoms must be given a private room and a private bathroom. So the compliance measures and the amended regulations allow IRCC to penalize foreign workers whose actions compromise public health. So under the new regulations, foreign nationals who are convicted for violating an order under the Quarantine Act or Emergencies Act would be considered inadmissible to Canada. And that foreign national would be unable to enter Canada for a one-year period without permission through an authorization to return to Canada request. So the new measures are quite serious and, and compliance under the era of COVID um, proves to be a challenging time for everyone and employers and foreign workers are no exception. So both employers and foreign workers face significant consequences for non-compliance and, and the regulatory changes demonstrate the importance being placed on public health. And I mean, I think only time will tell how compliance regimes will deal with the rapidly changing economic circumstances that are currently impacting employers in Canada right now. Okay, and, and Kelly, what about individuals that you know have their work permit approved uh, they are permitted to come into Canada or people that have a current work permit in Canada it was expiring they were able to get it extended inside of Canada and they've got issues with their social insurance number because it's expired what's going on with those so the good news is now the social insurance numbers can be applied for online um, the system was down for uh, a few days, but now we understand that it's back up. 
And so the um, applicant can apply for the SIN number online by uploading documentation to demonstrate their uh, primary and secondary identification, as well as their, um, you know, their work permit or their passport or their um, documents that prove their, their ID and their eligibility for a SIN. And, and that can be converted from the temporary SIN number that used to begin with a nine to an, a permanent SIN number if they've recently been um, landed as a permanent resident. So the good news is now SIN numbers are available to be applied for online and the paper application is no longer required, which used to require original documentation. So that, that's great news. So um, we encourage anybody that needs a new SIN number to look up Service Canada social insurance number and there's a process to apply online. Okay. And what about, you know, we've heard lots of discussions that immigration stopped. I mean, has the department stopped processing? Can you give us a little update on what's going on with, for example, express entry applications to apply for work permits, study permits, things like that? I would say it's business as unusual. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's, stopped in a practical sense because some of the milestones cannot be reached such as biometrics or medicals um, and, and, and we understand immigration has said has said that they are still open for business they are still accepting applications there's a two-week period when all applications for work permits were required to be submitted online um, and those applications can still be submitted so that um, applicants get in the queue but the major hurdle, the major roadblock that's affecting all applications, all new applications is biometrics. And biometrics requirements are were normally generated within 24 hours of submission confirmation. And then the applicant would then have a 30 day period to, to make an appointment to go to a biometrics collection center and do their biometrics. Well, most of those biometrics collection centers are closed. And so then immigration has provided everybody with an automatic 90 day period to do biometrics, but biometrics locations are still closed. And, and at, as far as we know, the USCIS field offices are closed until at least June 4th. So anybody in the United States that needs to do biometrics, we know that those locations are closed until early June. So without biometrics being completed, the application can't get processed. So yes, they still are open for business, but they can't move along on the application process on a practical sense. Now, if you are in Canada and you need to extend your worker or your temporary status, then the, um, Canadian, the Canadian offices are still processing. But again, if somebody needs to do biometrics, then that's not possible to do because the in Canada Service Canada biometrics collections locations are closed, but if biometrics are not required, then we are still seeing um, work permit extensions issued within Canada. Um, and I encourage everybody who has work permits that are expiring within the next six months to apply so that they are get in the queue. And as soon as immigration starts you know, ramping up again and, and when the um, the regulations get relaxed, then they're in the queue and they, they are not part of the floodgates. Okay. And, and Kelly, what about, you know, express entry? Can I go into express entry? You can go in if you've already completed your language test and you've received your education credentials assessment. So they are still accepting applications and they are still doing draws. And today there was a P and P specific draw, and the score was 589 um, for anybody that was in the provincial nominee category. And that was just, um, recently announced about an hour or so ago. So, you know, that's interesting. So, the express entry is open provided I have my uh, education credentials, provided I have my language test. If I don't, then I guess I can't go in the express entry at the current time. Is that correct? That's correct. You can't go in because you won't get um, you won't get points for it. And so what we're seeing is interesting. Interestingly, the distribution of the current pool in Express Entry is is changing because there there's not a lot of new people that can go in, and, and those people may have been quite competitive um, in, in the normal period. So those 
probably highly competitive candidates that could not go in are sort of allowing the, the candidates in the pool now to see a higher chance of getting selection because the points um, require the, the CRS cutoff um, we've seen in the last couple of draws has, has gone down and it's probably because new people that would have been really competitive with lots of Canadian, edu Canadian experience and education and whatnot are unable to go in because they can't do the language tests and the education ass assessments. Great. Well, thank you, Kelly. Um, I think we've pretty much covered everything that we planned on doing today. If there are any uh, questions, we'll certainly go ahead and try to answer them. But remember, that's very fluid. Whatever answer you get from Kelly or I today or whatever comments we've made today, it could all change uh, tomorrow, hopefully for the better. Yeah, and as I said, it's it's business as unusual. So that's, that's how we're describing it. Um, so I have see a question on... Um, so I have an expired PR and working towards 730 days. If I leave, can I return through the land borders? So it's unclear if you can return to the land borders because unless you have authorization to enter the United States, um, then you would then have to um, try to convince an officer um, to let you in. And if you don't meet the 730 days, then the officer um, has a very, very, um, wide discretion to refuse, write you up for, for being potentially non-compliant with the residency obligation. It'll still let you in. But it could still Kelly's, let you in. Yeah, Kelly's right. And, and it's interesting, um, because of the, you know, travel has gone down so much, many of the border officers are looking for things to do. So uh, be prepared for a lot more questions that you would have had in the past because there just is not the volume and officers have more time to inquire about your, for example, if you are a PR, your absences abroad, why don't you meet the criteria? But remember that if you're currently in Canada and your permanent resident card has expired, that does not mean that you've lost your permanent residence. It just means that you cannot travel on an aircraft to come back into Canada. And then also, even if you do get back in, you're going to have to show the 14-day quarantine um, plan as well. Um, the next question is are regarding um, confirmation of permanent residence approvals. So we are seeing um, approvals through email or, or online for new PR applications that are um, getting finalized. And immigration is saying that um, the, the confirmation of permanent resident document has to be signed along with the photograph, which is then couriered back to immigration, and then they use that information to generate the PR card. So as long as somebody that's been landed online or within Canada through email returns the confirmation of um, PR document along with the photos, then that document can get generated into a, a, a PR card. Um, but I mean, this process is so new, we have not seen PR cards generated yet just because of the processing times, but um, the, it's, the immigration says that PR cards are still going to be generated. And I think that's all the time that we have for questions. Perfect. Yeah, so that's all the time we have for today, folks. I would just like to thank everybody for attending today's webinar. I hope you all found it very useful and informative. I'd also like to thank Stephen and Kelly for taking their time today to share their expert advice. We really appreciate it. Uh, to everyone in attendance, please make sure to sign up to our e-alerts from the link provided on screen uh, to stay up to date with the latest inside immigration news and updates. And until next time, everybody, stay safe. Thank you.